Pierre Ferrari is the president and CEO of Heifer International, and he's with us right here on Rainmakers. Welcome, Pierre. Thank you very much, Stan. Appreciate uh, it. I have long admired Heifer International mm -hmm. because I know that I can buy a heifer for somebody, mm -hmm. and that's what you guys do, right? Well, we do more than that. We certainly do that. So if you buy a heifer or a cow or a goat or a camel or something, that animal or that particular program will be executed somewhere in the world. But accompanying the animal will be a very substantial amount of training, not just on how to take care of that particular animal, but also how to... We prepare the, we prepare the communities through what we call values-based, holistic community development so that they can take full advantage of a series of perspectives we offer the communities on how to organize as a group, how to think about themselves in a more holistic way, how to have optimism and hope, how to take responsibility through self-reliance, uh, begin to set up systems that, to maintain, that, that track accountability on the work that they do, all those kind of things. And then, of course, we offer a very specific training on how to take care of the particular animal. Mm -hmm. So you can improve the animal's health, improve its productivity, improve its welfare. I mean, part of the thing is to have, uh, you know, happy cows, but also healthy cows. So we do all of that, and it takes months. Um, our budgets, if you look at the way we organize our budgets, well over 60, well over 50 percent of the budgets are allocated to training. And so the mm -hmm. rest of the money actually goes to our, uh, moving the animals around, placing the animals. How do you know who needs what animal? Yeah, we you know we've been in, in this in these countries for a long time, so we've got connections um, in very many parts of the countries in which we we operate. We have a specific mission to our uh, to service or to help the poorest of the poor, and it comes from a, a kind of religious background that we had 70 years ago, which was guided by Christian principles of uh, serving the least among us. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we systematically look for uh, the most isolated invisible communities and then help them into into first subsistence and then into market connection. So how do you get there? I mean, how do, how yeah. do you get to communities that are as rural as they can be? Yeah, well, we have, uh, we have staff in the country. Uh, they are able to, uh, because they are people from that country, oh. all of our staff are, are locals, mm -hmm. and it doesn't take much of an effort to actually know where it is the communities are, because these communities aren't completely isolated. They will come down and they will need, you know, clothing and fertilizer or some other piece. So we know about them. Uh, they, people in, in the field or where we work understand the kind of work that we do. We work with governments, that kind of thing. Now, we, we have taken a strategy over the past two years of focusing and, and scattering our projects less so that we can get economies of scale and, and network effects that allow these communities, if they're, if they're gathered together, to have more an impact on the market or, or mm -hmm. share resources across a particular region. Hmm. What, is, what does all that mean? There's an awful lot there. Scattering your resources yeah. less, yeah. sharing more of the market, those right. are two pretty big and, concepts. And, they, and we're implementing very rapidly. What's, what's really interesting is to see that when you, when you do less scattering and you create more scale, the cost of delivering services on our part and also the value that's generated for the communities are enormously, I mean, not just 10 or 20 percent more, but they're multiplied. And so instead of working with, say, a group of, of, of families, say 200 or 250 families, our new projects are now systematically organizing and mobilizing tens of thousands of farmers. When you have that kind of organization, you have that kind of scale, you can begin to create the right systems and the right impact on the value chain so these farmers can now access markets in a more symmetrical way, meaning they have more power. Mm -hmm. as opposed to being completely dependent on a random trader or just going to the market and hoping to get a price. Now we can actually organize them and give them more autonomy and control over the value chain. And that, is, that has substantial impact on these families. Mm -hmm. So while you have your own knowledge about the, the animal needs of some farmers, right. do farmers ever come to you and say, I need a camel? Do they really say camel? Yeah, they do. So the, the process, the, the, the training process is a very interesting one. We begin with a set of values and principle we call the 12 cornerstones, which include things like uh, accountability, sharing and caring. And that takes a couple of months, a couple of tr uh, two or three training sessions where we really spend time on what are their motivations to get themselves out of poverty and, and, and improve their livelihood. Once you've got the sense of hope that, yes, they have assets, they have capability, and through organization they can get there, then we begin what is very well understood by a lot of people. It's just straight up strategic planning. What do you want? What do you want to do? How far do you want to go? What is what is your motivation in terms as a community? And that's where they'll say, you know, our and we we have that instance. The Maasai we're working with the Maasai in Tanzania, northern Tanzania, 
And one of the problems that community, that lodge community was facing was that their cattle was dying because of the drought through mm -hmm. climate change. And so and they knew about camels. They said, we need to start changing our herds from cattle to camels. And that's what we did. Hmm. And they've got camels now, and they've gotten used to drinking camel's milk instead of cattle, instead of cow's milk. It's, it's a radical change in our community, but they were smart enough to say, we can't keep these cows alive. There's just not enough water. Now, camels are, because of their adaptability mm -hmm. to a drought situation, are surviving well. And actually, it turns out there's a very good market for camel's milk. <laughs> so it worked out well <laughs> I, for everybody. I didn't know. I've never had camel's milk before. Right. Have you? Yes. It's sweet and very rich. Um, something <laughs> else that I noticed from preparing for the interview mm. is that, you know, not only do you provide the animals f as a source of food yeah. directly and indirectly, mm -hmm. uh, but also as a source of income. Tell me about that. Why would Heifer International be worried about the income of a farmer? So our mission, I mean, to be very simplistic about it, our mission is to end poverty and hunger and take care of the earth. And if you think about poverty, it's not, a, it's not, a con it's not just a, an abstract concept. You know, we have, we, the World Bank has issued specific guidelines, specific measures about when somebody is in poverty and when they're not. So income is a major component of that. Now there's some other, there's, there's some other aspects to it like assets and, and the stability of the income, but fundamentally, if you think about poverty, it is a, a certain level of income that's available on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. So you have to improve income, livelihood as it's called, but income is a basic notion there. And in many of my travels, I, one of the first things I do when I land in a particular country and meet my colleagues, I say, okay, what's the level of poverty we're trying to reach? Is it 200,000 rupees for a family of six in Nepal, or is it, what, what's the number? What is the number, and are we achieving it? It's one thing to say, I can double your income, but let's say the income is so low that even doubling it is still in massively inadequate. Well, it's inadequate. There's a, there's a level at which one can have a dignified life, and that includes, you know, a value for the, for the vegetable or grown and eaten by the family, et cetera, but this, it's reality. You know, what is the income? What have you got available? to be able to feed, nourish, educate, clothe, shelter, all those things mm -hmm. are very basic kind of notions. Why, why animals rather than a bag of seed? We, we do seeds. Uh, animals have an, an amazing advantage, right? They reproduce, yes. right? And seeds do too in a way, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. can plant it, but the, 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 the speed with which if you have chickens or you have goats or you have rabbits, the speed with which they can reproduce is a major income producer for a family. In addition, and this is a really important point, many of the poorest of the poor communities we work with, the asset value of the animal is an important component. This is where their savings go. You and I probably have broker accounts. You know, we, we put our money in a bank or an investment account or 401, you know, 401k or whatever it is. That's our savings. Their savings is the animal. They can keep that animal alive and if there's some health issue or some educational fee they'd have to pay, they can sell the animal, obtain the resources. They're not, these, these folks aren't bankable. They're not, yeah. they don't have accounts. So there's that, that, there's that other value. In addition to all that, um, a certain set of animals, goats, uh, chickens, um, uh, cows, obviously produce stuff that can be sold on a daily basis. Yeah. And that income flow is a really important flow. It's not only, it's also it's a source of nourishment and a source of income. So animals have an incredible ability to provide many of the resources that the poor require. So all around the world, food is not only important because it's something that people have to have to eat, but food is also important because agriculture is the basis of so many economies. Yeah. So, you know, I think we all know the, pop the population explosion that's still going on. About yeah. two, maybe two, maybe slightly more billion people are, uh, are joining us over the next 20 years. So we'll be moving from seven to maybe nine, nine and a half. It all depends on, on exactly what happens to birth rates. Who is going to feed those two billion, those additional two billion people? Today, we're not feeding our population sufficiently. Right? right. There's probably enough food globally, but it's it's hard to distribute. It's hard to for people to reach the food. Today, six hundred. There are six hundred fifty million smallholder farmers. About seventy percent mm -hmm. of them are women. They produce, ironically the same number, about 70% of the world's food today. So 650 million farmers produce 70% of, of the world food that's eaten on an everyday basis. If we don't improve the productivity of those 650 million smallholder farmers, you and I will starve. You and I, in 10, 15 years' time, will have problems feeding ourselves because of this incredible weight of people coming in. Hmm. 
And the, 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 most of the productivity is going to come from those smallholder farmers. You're here at uh, CGI 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, what, is, uh, what, are you, what are you doing here that's special from any other year in the past? Well, I came last year, and it's, uh, I don't know if, if people haven't been here, it is an amazing amalgam of people from corporations, governments, uh, uh, investors, bankers, and, well, of course, a fair number of nonprofits. And it is, to, to a first time comer, it's, 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 it's a bit chaotic. Yeah. You know, the second time around, I've sorted myself out, I know where to go, I know more people, and so I'm, I've, got, I've got no, you know, a better objective. I am. Uh, Heifer and a lot of other people now are looking for partners, are looking for people who are, who, who can create coherence to the work that we want to do from the very beginning of the value chain all the way to the, to the end. So I've talked to some investors, l real private equity kind of types, and then some folks who can help us do and, s and find the right production techniques to move, say, a goat farmer all the way to uh, a goat market in Kathmandu. You know, because somebody's got a process, this cold chain. It, it, gets pretty, it gets really exciting, but pretty complicated. So I've had meetings with folks who are innovating in how in in cold chain. There's this incredible stuff called uh, a nano ice, and they've come up with this way of uh, creating a, a, a slushed ice, which is very microscopic, which allows to chill down uh, meat or vegetables at a very rapid pace, which protects the, you know, that kind of th that kind of stuff at, at a very at a very affordable cost. Allows us to build value chains that are more efficient for the small farmer. Yeah. Over, the, over the years at, at Heifer, you've had mm. successes, and I suspect there's probably successes yet to be. What's the best examples of both? So we have a very large number of stories where the placement of a goat or placement of a cow has led to astonishing entrepreneurial success, where you know we have found somebody. because. It's not true that everybody has average abilities, right? There are some people with extraordinary abilities. And so we have all these stories about these women or men that pick up uh, the help, you know, that we've taught them how to fish, quotes unquote, in a metaphorical way. And suddenly they have access to resources and they become uh, major drivers for economic change in their community. They individually, as entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. start building incredible businesses. So we have these stories. Uh, and it, it ranges from a woman who has built this extraordinary um, dairy farm, essentially, in northern Tanzania. In China, we have this man who is now known as the Rabbit King. And he has, I mean, he is a rich man, not just, he's, you know, not just well off. I mean, he is a very rich man. And he started off with just a few pairs of rabbits, and, you know. <laughs> and now he, and it's astonishing kind of success we can point to those. The, the success to come is how we have scaled up our projects, assembled and mobilized large numbers of farmers, and then given them the tools, uh, the wherewithal, and access to capital and credit so that they can build these value chains. We've, got, we've done this in the dairy industry in East Africa. We're doing this in Nepal and behind the goat meat chain. Uh, we're doing it with the swine chain in Cambodia, that kind of thing. And these are large projects where the impact, the likely the future impact, is not only about the economic impact, the social impact, but also the political impact these communities are going to have. Instead of being disaggregated, scattered out with no political power and no voice, now suddenly, because they're going to be an industry that's organized through the, all, the, all the training that we do, they will be able to access and get services or access and, access and ex uh, executed services from government. So it's a very democratic thing that's going on. When, you, when you've got a whole community in a particular area that's organized and saying, we need roads, we need water, we need electricity. And you know, the economics, the economic analysis of getting that done is easily done. So it's not build a road and economic development will actually occur around it. It's the other way around. Mm -hmm. We've got all this cash flow flowing around the dairy industry, for example, in Kenya. And these, these, these farmers are organized now. And they're saying, you know, we need roads. The roads suck around here. And it damages our business. Because you know, it, it's really, literally hard to get the milk to the, to, the, to the processing plants. So that's changing the dynamic, the political dynamic, the local, regional, political dynamic. And that's, that's exciting because now the poor have a voice. With that, we're going to let that be the last word. Prayer. All right. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much. Take care, Stan. Appreciate it.